In today's video, I wanted to dive back into the Ossiarch Bone Reapers and explore the individual legions that make this army so terrifying. Even though I began the, the Bone Reapers series talking about the exactness and the calculating nature of the faction, the truth remains that they have found ways to be unique even within that. That there's still room in all their efficiency to be adaptable to their mission and their environment. To evolve themselves based on those things and their available resources. And you can hold that in one hand, in the other hand, they still have that precision that makes them so deadly. Now, there are six such legions mentioned in the Battle Tome, and today we're going to explore them all. As always with these kinds of videos, I want to make something very clear is that every legion has access to every unit, right? Assuming it's not a character or something like that. So if one focuses on, say, cavalry, you can and should still buy infantry for it if you're building it that way. Don't let these things constrict you, it's just adding a little bit of flavor and narrative to the different legions. I often get messages that are like, you know, I, I want to, I like this color scheme, but I can't because they're a cavalry based army and I want to own infantry. It's like, no, build whatever you want. These are like narrative nudges, not like walls. And so with that out of the way, let's talk about the Mortis Praetorians. And we'll start here because as these books often do, we start with the poster boys, right? The Mortis Praetorians are everything we explored about the Ossiarch Bone Reapers, only more so. Cold, calculating, exacting, and utterly dangerous. This is the Legion of Catacros himself, and in fact, all the named heroes outside of Nagash and Archon, who, who don't have like a specific legion that they work with, are, are from the Mortis Praetorians. When Catacros was selected for this role and presented his personal legion, right, who he would be working with, he went back to his little slice of the afterlife and pulled all the great generals who served him, both in life and in death. He took those souls and then had his soul masons meticulously split them apart into as many pieces as possible. Now you might see why. Well, he imbued each cohort, right, each like organization of troops with the experience, temperament, and determination of a great leader from the past. So an example here, just to kind of clarify, is that there's a cohort within his legion called the Jaquian Cohort. Each member has a sliver of the screaming soul of a general named Jaghak the Wise in them. He lives in eternal torment, torn to shreds amongst so many warriors. And so what this really does is it keeps all the fighters from a specific cohort on the same page because they all have this link intrinsically to each other and they all also share the same skill set from some great general in the past. One other thing that I really like about this, this legion, this army, the way it's composed is they're supposed to be the poster boys in the lore in, in the realms themselves. Like we look at them like, okay, well that's the company, you know, color scheme that GW went for. But the idea is when someone looks upon their works, right, they should see the paradise that Nagash has envisioned. And so their contracts are honored to the T. They build these incredibly ornate fortifications, demonstrating the artistry and order of Nagash's vision for the realms. They keep very exact numbers of troops at their disposal, with the morticians creating new soldiers as they fall in real time. And this is what I mean by saying Ossiarch Bone Reapers only more so, right? They're intended to be the spitting image of this faction, both for us as readers, but also for the, the people in the realms, because all the other ones we're going to talk about are a wild departure. And that's a lot of pressure to put on one, but of course, that makes sense that if you want to have your standout faction be like, you know, the perfect example of everything you're about, of course the Mortark and all the named characters are going to be a part of that one. Where the Mortis Praetorians are the picture-perfect design of an Ossiarch Bone Reaper Legion, the Petrifex Elite stand as an anomaly. And we're going to see this kind of a theme going on throughout the rest of these. There's this rumor that in the Age of Myth, as the legions were first being developed, that Nagash gave the Petrifex Elite uh, Morti Mortisians, or the, that whole cult, a mission, summed up in one sentence, but nobody knows what that mission was. It, there's a few theories like, Oh, your job is to go out and instill fear in the realms or crush people's hopes or to take on the finest bodily remains so no other necromancers out in the realms could use them. Whatever, you know, impression was made by Nagash upon this legion changed them drastically. They still retain the cold, calculating nature of the Ossiarch Bone Reapers, but they don't build societies or structures. The Petrifex elite are singularly focused on the devastation of their enemies. Things like artistry and fortifications and individuality 
are useless to them. The second bit about them that is arguably the most unique is their material. See, other legions will harvest any bones around them or available to them, right? people, animals, that kind of thing. But the Petrifex elite only make their soldiers with petrified remains from long dead creatures or people. Like fossils, think about it that way. Where the bone is slowly replaced with a rock composite. This generally makes them fewer in number, but they have unholy levels of durability and resilience. Each is a walking tank able to absorb incredible amounts of damage and deliver it in turn with these like eternally sharp blades. And it's this dark appearance of petrified bone that makes their look so unique. Or it's aesthetically my favorite of the legions. And the fact that they'll leave like material on the ground, like just normal everyday bones from like you and I, they'll leave them on the ground for less discerning, quote unquote, legions to find, I think is quite funny. They have this little like, I'm superiority complex based within them amongst other legions. Now, next up are the Staliarch Lords. Believing themselves to be noble warriors of honor and good repute, the Staliarch Lords are a terrifying sight to behold. This is a legion that leans very heavily on its cavalry to do the lion's share of the killing. They often run down their prey, encircle them, give them chase, and then the problem is, for as honorable and regal as they think they are, they are both terrifying to see and really sketchy in their dealings. When it comes to their looks, right, the Staliarch Lords run down their prey, but they don't do a whole lot of cleaning and caretaking afterwards, right? So this white bone that their mounts and even the warriors are made from is stained red and pink with the gore from their victims. They shred bone from flesh with their bare hands after combat in the field and hunks of meat and gore are clogged into the joints of their mounts and their limbs. It's really described as like, this like mobile horror show. And, and in this way, like when they show up to collect their tithe, they're wearing the remains, right? Like the, just the blood and viscera of the last person who failed to deliver, which I imagine makes it a very imposing scene. And that image right there is a good segue into their sketchy dealings, which is something else I want to talk about, which is first off, they will honor any deal or agreement that they make. So they're not like without honor in any sense of the word. They just happen to make insane demands and requests. So instead of doing the math, uh, like for example, like most of their legions would say, okay, well this faction has X number of people. Um, they will probably have this many dead in a year and we can calculate, you know, a reasonable sum of uh, material to gather from this little like, you know, village or something like that. Very reasonable stuff. Uh, they'll make outrageous demands. Like you need to have one ton, right? 2000 pounds of bones per person here, which is like, that's just, you know, maybe you can do it the first time, but not anything after that. Or they'll like pose a one-to-one -one challenge between the leaders of both civilizations, which of course, you know, you have a mounted mega hero for the Staliarch Lords versus just some average Joe. It's, it's a insurmountable fight. They're never gonna win. However, in the eyes of the Staliarch Lords, they've provided a means for the tithe to be met honorably. So when the person receiving this offer can't make it, they forfeit any rights to survival and are slaughtered brutally. If somehow the, the person receiving this offer can meet the demands, they'll live. Like I said, it's not like they're like backstabbing and stuff like that. Um, they'll honor the bargain that they make. They just make really outlandish deals. Almost to the point where it seems like the Staliarch Lords simply just don't want them to be able to achieve it. But by far one of the most interesting legions is the Ivory Host. And this is one that honestly, like just visually, they don't really appeal to me. Uh, but when I started digging into their lore, I fell in love with them. So, uh, led by the Monarch of Tusks, known in her firm, former life as Guri Za, the Drake Slayer Queen, they have one mission which is equally awesome and ambitious, and that is to conquer Gur, the Realm of Beasts. And I'll come back to that here in just a second. That's important, the location is anyway. Appearance-wise, the Ivory Host would fool you into thinking that their focus was on artistry, or aesthetic perfection, their bones are perfectly cleaned, meticulously kept in pristine condition, eternally sharp and well taken care of. They're also a, a naval focused faction, which is something that really wasn't gone into anywhere else in the lore. They sail in these fleets of bone constructs ships. So when they come into an area, it has this like macabre beauty to it, right? Uh, it looks super goth but you can see like the amount of artistry and care that's taken into it and it's just kind of breathtaking. 
And this all, this like veneer of everything looking perfect and clean, it all falls apart when they start fighting. Because here's the thing about the realms, they change you. And it's something I try to touch on whenever we talk about where factions are from or where they're fighting or going and that kind of thing. The, whatever realm you, you are in, it does subtly change you over time. Yuri Z was given a monumental task, taking a perfectly ordered army, remember Ossiarch Bone Reapers, into the rampaging world of wild beasts, right? They, they hunt colossal wild monsters on a daily basis. They're being infused with energies from Gur all the time. They construct their armies from the remains of these creatures. And of course, over time, it changes them. When an ivory host warrior falls, those around them just go into an absolute wild frenzy. They, they go nuts, right? They break ranks. They just start hacking and slamming. All of the things we love about Gur pour out of them. The thing is, it is Gur is like the polar opposite of what an Ossiarch Bone Reaper should be doing. It's not Bone Reaper-like, and it has everything to do with their environment. And they've actually been called out on this before. Because remember, all these heroes, when they bump into each other, like they do have to answer to one another, and everyone ultimately answers to Nagash. But the leader of the Ivory Hosts will start to recite the countless victories, uh, like, you know, their feral carnage that they've been able to achieve. And, you know, and saying like, well, you know, if we didn't, if we didn't fight like monsters, none of these would have happened. And so it kind of justifies them, and things kind of blow over a little bit. The, the truth of the matter is, though, it's made very clear in, in the lore entry here that they understand that the spirit of Gur has conquered them just as they seek to conquer the realm. And there's a quote that I think sums it up perfectly, right? This is actually a quote from Giriza, uh, the leader, and it says, To slay a monster, one must become just as monstrous. It is law. And I just, I love that quote because it's a very, first of all, the first part of it is a very Gur thing to sound like, right? Uh, to fight the monsters, we must become monsters ourselves. So, you know, that kind of thing. I absolutely love it. But then what makes it like that little bit of Ossiarch Bone Reaper thing is that the end tacked on is it is law. As if like, okay, we need to like make this craziness you know, fit squarely into our worldview. And so, I don't know, the law part, it just, it sounds very undead like, but tacked on everything else, you're like, but that doesn't make sense. <laughs> It sounds so structured for something so savage that you're describing. I like the combination of the two. Now, another really interesting take on the Ossiarch Bone Reapers, um, and this one has a lot less information, just raw information than others, uh, and that is the, the Null Myriad. They really began as a prototype of the Bone Reapers, right? In fact, it's said that they were the first of the legions. And the basic idea behind Nagash is, you know, playing around with the construction of these specifically was how much death magic can we stuff into them as possible and see what happens, right? What's the limit? Well, what this yielded was a legion of soldiers that were incredibly resistant to the warping and changing effects of magic and chaos. They became inflexible in their design. So saturated with one magic, particularly death, which is, you know, a very stagnant kind of energy, that everything else would kind of just bounce off of them. And this gave them a very unique set of skills that add to the Ossiarch Bone Reapers. Uh, Nagash and Catacros often send these warriors out to the far edges of the realms where they can exist in the most concentrated magical areas, but not be affected. Remember, the further out in most realms that you get towards the edge, magic becomes raw and rampant and it kind of just mutates and warps things. This legion can just walk through it like it's no problem at all. It's kind of like they're wearing a like a hazard suit for magic, right? Which has only become more useful with the Necroquake, which destabilized magic everywhere. Because now you have endless spells roaming in the lands, and they dissipate upon the Null Myriad shields. Uh, lightning attacks from wizards will fizzle out. Flames will disperse upon them. They are this magical Null Zone that Nagash uses to crush his enemies. And a cool tidbit... That's just kind of tacked in there randomly. I don't know. I wish there was, there was like a short story about it somewhere. Is that Arcan the Black struck a deal with Catacros when this legion was kind of in, in the midst of being created at some point. And so uh, Archon offered a bunch of his skeleton warriors who, of course, being near Archon and being near Nagashazar, are super densely infused with death magic themselves just by natural cause. But he offered, hey, you can use them and their bones for material to build more of the Null Myriad, right? Even more of that hardened death magic. 
In exchange, the Mortark of the Sacrament, meaning Arcan, uh, can call in these warriors as he needs. And it's kind of this uneasy tension between the two Mortarks, because the Mortarks don't, none of them really get along, none of them are friends, and they don't certainly want to be bound to each other, but it was a really good, you know, kind of communal deal. And having a, a legion that is, you know, such so resistant to magic in so many ways can be really useful for someone who is themselves devastatingly good at using magic. It means, you know, I can attack my enemy with magic, but they can't get me back. And I would just love to read like a short story of that conversation when they strike that deal. I think that it would just add a lot of character to both of the Mortarks, and, and we could maybe see the value of the Gnome Myriad there. Now, last up is probably the biggest departure from Ossiarch Bone Reaper, like generic lore, right? When we talked about all the things about the Ossiarch Bone Reapers, this is the one that's like, okay, those guys are just different, right? And this is the Crematorians, where other legions are designed to grow and spread and build cities, largely, most of them are. Um, the only purpose of the Crematoriums is destruction, right? Everything else is secondary or non-existent. Defenders of a city will look out at the night and see an endless sea of torches of their enemy drawing near. And they're like, oh my gosh, we gotta get the defenses ready, we're gonna be fine, we gotta hunker down. And it's only too late that they realize those are not torches at all. But it's like literally the hateful fire of Nagash burning inside of every crematorium unit. And that's pretty much how it's described too, right? These flames represent Nagash's ire and it consumes the troops in a terrifying way, making them the most expendable Ossiarch Bone Reapers to exist. This fire inside of them is constantly consuming them. Their lifespan is measured in weeks, not years, which is, you know, kind of the opposite of what you want for like an undead eternal army, right? They burn themselves out. And and the Mortigians are constantly at work replenishing the ranks. And the basic way that they fight is this. The first wave invades the city, fights like mad, they blow up as they die, and use themselves to burn down all the buildings. The second wave then comes in, collects the phylactery gems, which we talked about, basically soul stones, right? It has the, the mind and the soul of the warrior still inside of them, and the masons then build new bodies, and the whole process starts all over again. And while this makes for a powerful tool of destruction and fear for Nagash, right, this is his hammer that he can throw at people to terrify them, it's a frustrating life for all the leaders of the Legion. Because they can't really grow, the turnover is a constant issue, and even like all the leaders who, some of these from the original like founding Legions are, I mean, they are truly immortal, they've been around for hundreds and hundreds of years, but even these leaders are burning out, and they have to like make promises to one another like, hey, Will you bring me back? Will you get me a new body so I can come back? And, and so much so is this kind of frustration that their field commander, Zaranos, uh, tries to scour libraries and arcane repositories for a quote-unquote cure, like how do we put the fire out so we'd stop burning before we can like, grow and do good before everything is burned down by the first wave. So I like this one, you know, as much as it is a wild departure, I like it because it has this little bit of subversion to authority there that I like, where it's like, you know, they haven't found anything yet, but the fact that they keep looking for a way to undo the way that they were designed by Nagash, kind of, it's, it's almost like they're searching for something that's close to hope, even though this is a faction that would not have hopeful people. So, I mean, that, you know, that's one of, one of those, those factions that like, Whenever there are those factions that have these big, hard right turn departures from the established lore of like the army itself, people either love it or hate it. There's not really much in between. Um, personally, I, I like it. If there wasn't that little tag on of like, and the heroes are all trying to find a way to stop this, um, I would think they're kind of bland, right? It's like, oh, they just kind of burn themselves out. That's weird. But the fact that they, they have enough autonomy to be like, we were made broken and wrong and we need to fix this but ultimately, they're still servants of Nagash, right? The reason they want to fix it is so that they can keep killing people in the glory of Nagash. And so it's this fun little, like, you know, it adds just a little bit of personality to them that I really enjoy. Now, uh, really quickly, because there's so many of them, I'm not going to go into super detail, but why are these legions cool? Some of them are wild imaginings of Ossiarch Bone Reapers, and that's a good thing, because when you have an army that's described as so 
rigid and can definitely be considered um, stale. You know, I mean, when I say stale, I mean like stagnant. It's probably a better word than stale. Uh, but what I mean is like, you know, everything is talked about being very regimented and calculated and that kind of stuff. Um, the fact that you, you get to see that in different lenses across the realms, given their environment and what they're building themselves with, that kind of stuff, I think is really interesting, right? You can maintain exactness while also being built for a specific job like the crematorians or being affected by things around you like the ivory host. And I like that they took the time to make all of these very, very different. And so if nothing else, if you don't like any of them, that's fine, but consider it an invitation to make something wild yourself. And I think that that's a really cool thing. You know, if nothing else, it's permission to be like, you can be exacting and crazy, you know, perfect, but also these places that they go to are wild. And so you can kind of craft whatever backstory you want. I think that was a smart move. I already showed my cards and I said uh, what my favorite was. It's the Ivory Host. I love anything Gur and the fact that they are kind of incorporating slowly the, the madness of the hunt that is Gur with their very structured and regimented law abiding nature is just a really cool twist that I thought was very interesting. But I'd love to know which of the legions was your favorite and uh, tell me why. You know, what are you painting up? If you're painting uh, your own, what is the story behind your own? Leave the comments down below and we'll continue the conversation there. Thank you all so much for watching and happy wargaming.